Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, what does it mean to be a mama bear in the Arctic? Presented by NatHab Expedition Leader, Christina Disney. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Over to you, Christina. Thank you so much, Rob. And thank you everyone for joining in today. I had admittedly a lot of fun making this webinar and I'm very excited to share it with you all. And just before I move on, I just wanted to read aloud the, the quote I put up here on the first slide, which is that a mother's love for her child is like nothing else in the world. It knows no law, no pity. It dares all things and crushes remorselessly all that stands in its path. So thank you, Agatha Christie, for those very elegant words. There's another phrase, which I feel like this is the more um, more poetic way to say what this other phrase is, which is that mama bear is such a sweet way to describe the fact that if you hurt my child, I will rip you open and eat your insides, which I saw on a t-shirt somewhere and I almost died laughing. So I was partially the inspiration for this, I admit. But the other part of it is my own dear mom, who I'm very happy to show a picture of here today. This is from our Christmas, I guess last year now, or the year before, hard to say. Um, so just a quick shout out to my mom and all the gratitude and love for the years that she spent raising, protecting me, and arguably probably still doing it in some ways today, even though I'm not aware of it. So much love, mom. Kisses from afar. Very excited to see you coming close to next Christmas here. All right, but alas, you are not all here to hear about my amazing mom. You are here to hear about the amazing moms of the Arctic. And I know that there will be, as you probably expect, many cute, cuddly, wonderful pictures of white fuzzy bears to go about this. But I'm actually going to start our story off with something that's a bit harsh. Um, because I think this kind of lays out the odds of what it is that when, when polar bears are becoming mothers and the odds that they're facing in order to actually get their cubs start to survive to adulthood. So... Female bears, polar bears, they can become sexually mature around four or five years old. The average lifespan of a polar bear is around maybe 25, 27-ish, potentially. And so that means that in a polar bear's, in a female polar bear's life, there's about 21 years where she's, like we'll just say for easy math, uh, able to sexually reproduce. Now their cubs, how long that they raise them for is around two and a half or three years throwing around a lot of numbers, but essentially that means that there's the potential for her to have cubs seven times in her lifetime, right? As you can see here by this acute, adorable picture, they tend to have twins. Sometimes they have singletons, sometimes they have triplets, but on average, polar bears usually have twins. So that means if we just stick with the law of averages, that in her lifetime, if she can have cubs potentially seven times, and let's say she's she does become pregnant seven times and carries them to term, that means that she will have on average, 14 cubs in her life. Now, if we take a second and we think about population dynamics, if she's having 14 babies, that seems like a lot of babies, right? Um, the average, po or sorry, the population of polar bears in the world right now is estimated to be around 25,000. And there's some populations that are in decline, that are increasing, that are stable. But in general, we think that that's pretty close to overall kind of stable. There's some population declines happening that we've got our eyes on, but but in general, it's not like it's growing a lot, right? So that means that, unfortunately, out of those 14 potential cubs that she could have, it means that most of them are not actually surviving into adulthood. So population, population dynamics, not the most sexy thing to start talking about, but it kind of lays the groundwork. So the odds are, if we want to really look at it, is that the first four years of a polar bear's life they have a 75% 70, survival rate each year the first four years. So if we just take this as an example, imagine this year in Hudson Bay, there are 100 cubs that are born. So at the end of this year, only 75 out of those 100 will still be alive. So that'll be end, at the end of the first year. At the end of the second year, then only 75% of those survive. So that gets us around about 56. So really only about half of those bears make it to being two years old. By their third year and fourth year, which are another two really hard years for bears to make it through, they will also only, they'll have a 25% die-off rate. So that means by the third year, there's only around 42 left. 
And by the third year, there's only 31 bears out of the original 100 cubs that were born that are making it into adulthood or sexually adult. Uh, for females, they sexually mature around five. Males are not actually going to sexually mature until about nine or 10. But ultimately, it's this idea that that window of time is the really critical one. And if they can make it through there, they'll probably survive the next 20 years. But there's a huge, huge die off. So if we bring those numbers back to our single mom here who's having her 14 cubs, it means that out of the 14 cubs that she gives birth to, odds are only four of them will survive, which is pretty brutal, if I'm being quite honest. Um, but also, if we zoom out and look at where they live in the world, it's not the most hospitable, inviting place. And so they have evolved in order to give the best chances to their offspring as possible in order to see them to the end. And that's kind of the story that we are going to walk through today. So first, if we just think about our mama bear as she relates to the rest of her population, they're not as bulky as the males because one, a lot of their energy is growing into is going, excuse me, into rearing their young. So while males might weigh up to about 700 uh, kg, so they can be like 1,400 pounds, sometimes even up to 1,800. Females often only weigh in at around maybe 400 to 600 pounds. Really heavy ones, you might get up to 700. Um, every now and again, you'll see a really fat female at 1,000, but those are, those are a rarity. And they're becoming more and more so um, all the time. And so one of the ways that we actually look at population health is not just the number of individuals, but you can look at sort of the quality or the body condition of each of those individuals. So this graph here is from a study on the polar bears in southern Hudson, uh, excuse me, the southern Hudson Bay population. So those are the ones uh, sort of around that would have their cubs around either Ontario or potentially into Manitoba as well, or uh, over on the Quebec side a little bit. And so this graph, what they were wanting to show, because they've got like the body condition, so how healthy they are over the time. And what they were kind of focusing on was the study that they showed was that, you know, uh, all these different populations, you can see that all of them, their body condition has been declining over years. And so that's a really big stress on the whole population because if everyone is less healthy, it's less likely to make it to adulthood or to raise healthy cubs. So that's what the overall population decline is going to lead to. But the thing I wanted to focus in on here for the female story is I wanted you to look at, so we've got the females with young are the blue hollow circles and then the adult females who don't have any babies, the solitary females are the solid blue circles. And so an adult female without any cubs has the highest, healthiest body condition. Doesn't matter if you look at sort of past or present. And then females who are raising young have the lowest body condition. That means they're making the most sacrifices to their own health in order to see their young through to adulthood. And so it's, uh, it's common, and honestly, in, in quite a lot of species that it goes that way. But I think, you know, we often, what's the right way to say this? You know, when we talk about the job of what it is to raise a child, we often look about it as like time or things. But but I think we as people, when we think about raising kids, you know, we think about whether or not you work away from home or you don't work about. But we don't think about just the actual physical toll that it has on your body to raise a child. Um, right. And that's there's the birth of the child, but then there's all the energy that goes into it afterwards. Right. And so, um, you know, for all of us out there, give yourself a pat on the back if uh if you are in the process of raising a child, because there's a lot that goes into it that doesn't make it on paper uh, in lots of different ways. All right, so let's start the story. If, if we're gonna start it with our, with our female here, with our mama bear and her story of raising cubs, some folks could say that the story would start with the mating season, which is in April. You know, it's the classic, it takes two to tango kind of thing. Um, but I would disagree when it comes to bears. Uh, bears, like a lot of other carnivores, their story is a little bit different because they have something that's called delayed implantation. So essentially what that means is that the body is actually deciding for itself whether or not it thinks it's suitable, healthy enough to have a baby. So this is what delayed implantation looks like. In the springtime, the female is ovulating, produces eggs, the male sperm will fertilize those eggs, and then what happens is that they do start to um, so first it's the zygote, then it begins to split and create more cells. Then it gets to what's called the blastocyst, blastocyst phase. There we go. And then it pauses. It essentially just kind of puts everything on hold until the autumn. And so this is why that process happens and is so important. And in the Arctic, 
it has to do with this beautiful picture, believe it or not. What you're looking at is the coast up in the Arctic and over the water, that white that you're seeing isn't clouds, it's actually the sea ice. And that beautiful green pot of ink that you're looking at that looks like it's been spilled and swirled through the ocean is actually a phytoplankton bloom. And it's tied to the melting of the sea ice. So very beautiful, very aesthetic when we look at it from a satellite from space. So I hope you still like that image because I want you to remember that as beautiful as it is, this is what that phytoplankton looks like if we were to actually look at it sort of in a cross-section view from the sea ice downwards. So what's happening is every spring, as our Earth is tilting back towards the sun and the northern hemisphere starts to warm up and get all nice and sunshiny, the sea ice starts to melt. And so there's lots of um, phytoplankton, diatoms, little algae that are trapped in the ice and they're also sort of free floating. And as that ice breaks up and we get more and more daylight, they all go crazy and bloom and that kicks off the beginning of the food chain. So that means that animals are congregating and they're feeding really heavily in the springtime. And so that's the root of the Arctic food chain. Compared to some other places in the world, the Arctic food chain is not really complex. Even though it seems like there's a lot of arrows here, we could go to somewhere like the tropics and there would be, you know, a hundred times more organisms with 50 more arrows. But the Arctic food system has fewer species, but a lot of all of them, right? It's all about abundance. It's this fast and feast cycle that it rolls through. And that feast starts in the springtime, which is why polar bears start their feasting then. Uh, that's that's why mating is also paired with that because it's when there's the most amount of food, it's when they're starting, polar bears tend to be um, in closer vicinity from one another, there's more resources, so they actually have the energy to find mates. It's all tied together. So this picture is actually pretty cool. This is from this year. This is taken, um, this is a satellite picture that was taken on June 28th. And so again, um, well, those are clouds over the green part, over the land, but this is Churchill, Manitoba in the top left there. and then. Again, those are not clouds, that's actually the sea ice uh, that's forming on the bay. And as a cool, quick nerdy science notion, you know, when we look at the clouds in the bottom left and you look at the ice in the sort of the top right, they look really, really similar, right? But at the end of the day, it makes sense because both the clouds, which are moved by the fluid of the air, and the ice, which are moved by the fluid of the water, tend to have the same swirly pattern. So that's one of the ways that they end up looking the same. I think it's just one of the cool things that happens in nature, but that's a quick aside. Anyway, so this is the sea ice breakup. And so this year, unfortunately, is one, uh, probably the top three earliest breakups that we have on record. So this year, ice breakup, which is essentially quantified as when there's less than 30% of sea ice left on the bay, um, was estimated to happen around June 17th, right? So now there's these swirls of ice left, and this, this is the where the bear is hunting from, right? Remember, polar bears are marine mammals, but it's not so much that they spend a lot of time swimming, it's more like they're platform hunters. They like to hang it on the sea ice and they hunt from there and they live off of that floating mass. And when that floating mass melts, they either have to travel further north to find more stable ice to spend the summer on, or for our, like our southern bears in the western Hudson Bay, they're gonna make their way to land, right? So this is that last bit of ice that you're looking at. And so the females are hoping to mate and put on a bunch of weight before all this happens because then they have to spend the summer fasting. And the fasting part is really what decides later on whether or not they're going to have cubs. So this here shows you, this is um, basically since 1975, how the sea ice has been behaving in Western Hudson Bay. And so the, the freeze update is when in the fall does it get cold enough for the ice to reform? And then break update is when is it that it's warm enough in the summer that the ice leaves. And so that window of time in between, the number of days that they have to spend without ice to hunt on is the number of days a female has to spend fasting. And the other bears do. All the bears are fasting at this point, right? And so unfortunately, that time that they've been fasting has been getting longer and longer and longer. And so it's really, really important that females put on as many calories as they possibly can, put on as much fat on their body as they can before that breakup happens come June. It used to happen later in like July, and so that meant that the bears had even less days fasting. So here's where the we're gonna bring back a little bit of that math that I had earlier. So on average, 
once they switch over their metabolism and they start fasting, uh, the bears need around 1.6 pounds, give or take a little bit, depending on the day, um, of fat. That's how much of their own fat they're burning through to survive. So a bear in Western Hudson Bay, like a female, she needs to weigh at least 400, 450 pounds at minimum just to survive through the fasting season, right? And so in the springtime, they're eating as many calories as possible, eating as many seals as they can so that they can actually make it through and have enough energy um, the fall. Now, there is no such thing as a two-fat polar bear. If you ever have the chance to see one that is round and it's like a nice big tube that is the most beautiful polar bear and you should compliment her as she waddles by and they really do waddle once they get that fast they're they're once they get that fat excuse me their bellies drag on the ground and their arms somehow suddenly look too small it's really hilarious but very endearing um so they put on all that weight so that come fall now this is what i this brings us back to what's the delayed impl delayed implantation happens so if they're nice and fat, that means that that blastocyst that's been sort of sitting there floating away from the uterine wall, not quite attached to it yet, hasn't implanted. This is what happens. So in that mating time, they probably actually fertilize several eggs. And now what's happening is depending on the health of the body come October, November, the body is going to decide, am I healthy enough to carry one baby, two babies, three babies, or no babies? There's only been one ever recorded. Uh, recorded what's not what's the above triplets four of a kind my brain is running slow triplets um used to be more common but as that body health as i was showing you has that declined in a lot of populations triplets are a lot more rare you still might see them every now and again twins are still common uh, and then usually if they have one baby they're either a new mom or they're an old mom usually healthy moms their bodies are, are able to have twins and so this is the point where it doesn't actually matter she could have she could even have maybe five you know uh, fertilized eggs, but that doesn't mean anything. Her body is going to shed some of them and accept the others. So that's what's then going to transition her to the next phase of her cycle, which is building a den. So polar bears will build their den, they build snow dens. Um, they will dig into the peat if they are coming to land. They'll actually, can, they can either have a partial snow or they'll put, dig down into some of the dirt, but the majority of all polar bears are going to dig themselves a snow den. And so size-wise, they are they can have the tunnel to get into them, can be several feet, sometimes 9, 13 feet long, and then they tend to have sort of a few different chambers. Um, or they might have a single one, sort of depends on, on how much building she's doing. I almost got rid of this picture, to be honest, because there's a few things in it that I don't like that I think are not really true. But then I realized that it was worth keeping just to explain what it was that I kind of disagreed with fundamentally. So the first thing that's not really true here is that where it says hole for air is not really a thing. And I'm going to explain this for a few different reasons. Uh, one, we think about heat conservation. You would never, polar bears are smart enough to not build a hole at the top of their den. Because if she does, all of that heat that is coming off, radiating off her body, and remember snow, Snow is a really good insulator. If anyone ever built a snow fort as a kid, it's pretty cozy on the inside, right? Inuit, they literally build houses out of snow, different northern populations, etc. And so if you have a hole at the top, all the heat that's radiating off her body would then escape. So they wouldn't actually have that. The other amazing thing about snow is that snow actually does allow air to pass through it. So they could have, the entire thing could get blown over. And as long as the snow doesn't get a layer of ice on it, it's completely breathable. So it's totally non-essential for them to have a hole for air. Sometimes they have a second hole because they might have dug out one when a snowstorm happened, but they're not digging a hole for air. What they will do for air passage is that they do actually warm up enough that their breathing causes a layer of ice to form. They actually scratch through the ceiling and make sure that the snow stays nice and porous. So that's one thing. The other thing here is with the different cub chambers is that they might she might have multiple chambers, but what she'll if they do do it that way, she would still be able to get into all of them, all of them, right? This sort of notion that it's like just for them isn't really true because the only one building the chambers is her, right? So anything, any of the chambers would be big enough for her to move between. Um, yeah, I think those are the only two things. Oh, and then just the last thing, again, amazing 
sort of snow architects that they are. So that entrance tunnel, this one they actually do have right on here, which I appreciate. So if you look at that entrance tunnel, you notice that it kind of slopes down a little bit and polar bears completely build that intentionally because that way they have they do have the hole for their you know, airflow if that's what's necessary. But because it has a downward portion, it actually traps the coldest air at the bottom of the entrance tunnel and then rises back up, which means that it helps trap the warm air coming off of her body from stopping to going out. So actually pretty amazing little engineers when you look at it that way. So when they build these dens, they tend to occupy them for the majority of the winter, or sorry, not majority of the winter, well, yeah. So they would build the den, um, let's say October into November, and then there's about a 60 day gestation period. So cubs will be born January, but that window of time when they're waiting for the cubs to be born, they have to, sometimes they have to do maintenance, you know, sometimes they might redig. If a really big snowstorm happens and they get buried in a couple more feet of snow, they might actually dig themselves higher. Um, unfortunately with climate change, one of the things they do have to worry about is freezing rain can cause suffocation. So remember I said if there's, if it ice is over, so icing before was from the inside, but if you get a crust of ice on the top, that can really stop them being able to breathe, which is a scary one. Excuse me. So they're modeling their home or their den sort of as that time goes. And a cool thing is that if we look at where polar bears den here in Canada, we can see that they actually have quite strong preferences to different areas. So uh, all the little blue dots are different denning locations. And here around Churchill, we're gonna be heading off to here in just a few weeks, is one of the most highest densest, highest densities of bear dens um, that we have in the world, it's in the top three. So it's pretty amazing. Bears travel from all over to den in these different locations. And they are um, loyal or they do have like a den fidelity. They, they tend to go back to the same places where they were born. So they're in the den. We've talked about sort of what she's built going on on the outside. But now if we talk about what's actually happening on the inside of the bear's body, if you think about it. So I said gestation is about 60 days or two months. So that means November and December, she is laying there almost barely or not moving, minus you know a few home renos here or there. So if you or I were to lay in bed for months, right? They're not... Um, you know, we would have to worry about things like blood clots and bed sores and our muscles essentially deteriorating. Uh, forget about nutrition and everything else, right? Whereas bears' bodies are extremely efficient. Uh, and this is true not just for polar bears, but for other bears as well. But polar bears um, kind of take the cake on some of these things. So one of the things that we don't, I think that we take for granted um, is that we, you know, because we're not a fast feast beast as humans, we are used to having regular food inputs, but if you're an animal like a bear who has early on in the springtime, eat you know, 60, 70% of your calories that you need to then last you for the rest of the year, your body gets really, really efficient at conserving those nutrients and those different um, proteins and things like that. So they're not, so for the time that she is denning and waiting to have her cubs, she's not eating or drinking. That means that her body's actually recycling all of the proteins, right? So instead of her muscles breaking them down, or if it, would, it would go into urea, then it goes into ammonia, and then it actually goes back into for her muscles to be used again, which is um, pretty incredible. And it's something that we've been studying, people have been studying for a long time to try and see if they can use that to, to help in human healthcare as well. So pretty darn amazing. All right, we're getting to some of the cute and adorable pictures as per promised. So after 60 days of gestation, so bringing that pregnancy to term, the cubs are born. And when they are born, they are like adorable little white mice. They can't see, they're born, um, their eyes are not developed yet. And they're about a foot long, 12, 13 inches or so. And uh, if, take, if I take time to take some criticism or some compliments that I should say that I got from a previous presentation that I did to some grade oneers a little while ago, she said, my favorite, this was from Amy in grade one, and she said, my favorite part of the polar bear presentation was learning that baby polar bears are as big as a brick of bread. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's an alliteration. Are as big as a brick of butter because they are really cute. So thank you, Amy. It was fun presenting that. And that was their favorite fact from some of those kids. So I'll share that with everyone today. Those little polar bears weigh approximately the same as a brick of butter when they're born. So they weigh about maybe a pound, a pound and a half at most. Um, which is kind of crazy if you think about it because the female at the time is probably weighing close to 
five, 600 pounds. And so that's a huge discrepancy between um, infant size and adult size. You know, for humans, you know, you might have like an eight, 10 pound baby to 150, 200 pound human, right? Which is usually sort of like a, you know, anywhere from that five to 10% body weight. But really these are less than half a percent of what mom weighs. So pretty crazy. Um, but really another way to think about that den is almost like an external um, incubator, right? So they're born, but they stay in that den and they are getting them up to a more developed stage before they really enter the world, enter the world, excuse me. All right, so after those adorable little babies are born, uh, most of that time spent in the den, the next really couple months, uh, are really just a cycle very similar to what we have with our newborn human babies of a circle of wants and needs, right? Um, little polar bears will either cry because they're hungry and mom will scoot them up, lay on her back and scoot them up to her to her nipples, uh, to her teats. They only have um, four, whereas grizzlies actually have six. It's one of, the, one of the different evolutionary things that have changed. It's because they have smaller cub sizes or litter sizes than grizzlies do when they evolved away from their, their nice cousins. Um, the other response from little, little newborn polar bears is that they'll shiver. So they, tend to, they have to lay on mom's fur and they're not really capable of producing much heat of their own yet. So they kind of insulate in around her. And so if they, get, if they tend to squirm too far in the wrong direction or they fall off onto the snow, they'll start to shiver and mom can feel that and, uh, and pull, them, pull them back up. Um, she'll clean them. She will lick up all of their waste, both as a way to get some of those nutrients back into her, but to keep the den nice and tidy as well. And one really cool study that just came out uh, I think in just the last couple of years, at least I only found it uh, more recently, was that they were studying the sounds that cubs make when they're nursing. And so there's the actual act of nursing that sort of um, sucking on the teat, which helps the milk flow and drops that down. But then there's also actually they hum. So they found out that, or they've, they've looked into it and cubs will hum when they're nursing as a sign of contentment. And that that humming actually also releases oxytocin in the mum. So it does, it's both like a self-soothing thing for both. It's like it release, it creates and releases happiness in both of them, which I thought was, was pretty sort of adorable and amazing to tie those things together. So that's pretty much their life in there for the first month or so. Around the first month, give or take a little bit, is when the eyes will open. And once the cub's eyes are open, then that's when curiosity begins and starting to move around the den more actively. Um, and starting to put on lots of weight, right? So when they're born, I said they weigh around about a pound. By the time they're two months old, they weigh close to 10 pounds. Um, and that's all thanks to the lovely fat milk of mother, which, uh, believe it or not, is actually can be almost up to 46%. So think about that when you go to the store and you're ordering milk or you're buying your milk and you've got your, your 3% and you think that's a little creamy. Uh, it's more like a, a full-on half and half the whole time. All right, so she's keeping them clean. They are from two to four months. They're starting to get a little more nimble, wanting to move around. And it's sort of at that, or sorry, two to four. Around that three-month mark is when den emergence is gonna gonna start to show up. And so by the time they're around three months old, when it's time to come out of the den, so if they're born in January around New Year's, somewhere around that March-ish period um, is when mom is gonna start making efforts to emerge from the den. So that's gonna start off with, actually just very simply, mom will start poking, she'll actually, if the, if the cave or the entrance is grown in, she'll actually poke her nose out and she'll get some air flow going into it. Because up until this point, actually the den has been moderated by her body temperature and they haven't had to be dealing with the outside temperatures. So those cubs uh, might have only been really exposed to maybe like minus 10 at the most, sometimes even to like zero degrees Celsius or 40 Fahrenheit. And the reason why, again, snow is highly insulative, you've got this uh, you know, multiple hundred pound bear whose body heat is being radiated off and all that heat is staying inside. And so the first week of when she decides that it's ready, that they're ready to go out into the world, she's going to slowly let them get used to the temperature before she really allows them to leave. And then when she decides that they're ready to face the world, then she'll let them out. And then they'll spend the first couple weeks of their life just kind of hanging out outside of the den. Um, she'll, they might go outside to nurse or still nurse on the inside. 
um, but it's mostly just about them sort of playing a little bit, becoming acclimatized to the temperature, and building up little bits of stamina, little by little. So the cubs, when they emerge, we talk about that acclimatization, they actually are ready to face the cold pretty well, believe it or not. So these little baby cubs, who are only a few months old, their lower critical temperature is actually minus 30 degrees Celsius. So lower critical temperature, what that means is what temperature does your body start to shiver at or does it start to have to actively set energy aside to keep you warm, right? So for me sitting here in my climate controlled room, just by moving a little bit and eating and talking, I don't have to create any energy to heat me up. Just my regular activity is keeping me warm. So that's kind of the threshold of my regular activity is keeping me warm. My regular activity is not enough to keep me warm. And so I actually have to start burning calories to create heat, not just because I need to move around. So that's pretty amazing. Little tiny cubs don't start to shiver until minus 30. And then even at minus 40 or minus 45, they only need to up their metabolism by about a third to stay warm. So that's pretty amazing. Us humans, we're kind of sad and pathetic. For us in Celsius, I think it's about six degrees that we start to shiver at. So they're on a whole different playing field. Now, that's what's true as long as their fur is dry. Because at this point, these little cubs, they've been growing a lot and they've been building up muscle, but they haven't been putting on fat like their, like their mama bear yet, which is really a part of a lot of their uh, their energy and their insulation comes from. They've just been building and growing, right? And so their fur, which is very, very dense, is what's been keeping them warm. But that warmth is much, um, they lose it if they go for a swim. This is the most, one of the most vulnerable parts and unfortunately one of the ways that cubs tend to die off. Uh, so it's the thing that, that mothers will almost avoid at all costs, which is making their cubs swim when they're very, very young. So instead of being able to stay warm, uh, as soon as their fur is wet in ice water, their body temperature drops by 11 degrees in 30 minutes. So even, even just being in the water for two, three minutes is a huge shock to their system and they have an insanely hard time of warming back up. So mums, when they're taking them out of the dens and they're starting to travel with them, they will go great lengths and walk obscene distances if it avoids having to swim. Swimming is the last resort for a little baby cub. Okay, so we've gotten to the point where the cubs are out of the den, they've got a little bit of energy, they've gotten used to the climate, and now it's time for them to start making moves back to the sea ice or back to hunting grounds. Because if we backtrack for a second, I remember we said that mom was gonna fast for the summer, but she's also been in a den this whole time. So she's actually been fasting this whole time since the ice thawed back in June. So if we think about that for a second, if you were a mama polar bear right now in, uh, in Hudson Bay, so we don't go from this year from last year. So let's say uh, last year, if it thawed at the end of June, so that's all of July, all of August, September, October, November, December, January, February, February, March, arguably, you've got eight, potentially around eight, maybe even up to nine months, hope not, hopefully not, that you've been fasting. Uh, and not only you've been fasting, you underwent, you carried through, you carried a pregnancy, and now you are raising, you know, a couple cubs, and all that is off the body stores of energy that you had. So this whole time, mom is insanely hungry, and now that the cubs are up and able to move, it is time to start going towards a food source. And so they will start that journey. For some mums, depending on where you are in the Arctic, that might be, you know, only a few hundred meters. For others, that can be a journey of 50 kilometers even. And on that journey, mom is extremely patient because even though those little cubs are now, you know, they're totally fine being out in the open, um, they don't have any stamina, right? They haven't built up any muscles yet. They spent their whole lives living in a little tiny den. Uh, and so they can really only walk short distances at a time. And so moms here, I would say, have amazing patience. Uh, they'll stop very often multiple multiple times a day to let them rest to nurse and feed and then she'll kind of cajole them up a little bit and keep them moving a little more and it's just a series of that all across the uh, all across the ice until she can get to somewhere where she can find them some food 
The other thing that happens once they leave the den is that there's a level of wariness that Mama Bear never gets to sort of stand down from for the entire time that she's a mom. And that wariness is coming from other predators, right? It could be things like wolves in the area. Uh, and to be honest, it's quite often other bears. And that's for a few different reasons. Um, it can be, you know, out of starvation or food, other bears can be a threat. It can be out of male bears wanting to kill off the cubs so that the female, that, so that they can mate with the female later, right? Um, so unfortunately, those are both real things. And so when a mom does have cubs, she pretty much avoids all other bears like the plague. She just wants nothing to do with them. So this picture here uh, from left to right is a mama bear and one cub standing up and the other cub looking off to the right. And I don't know if you can see it super well in this photo, but if you just look across the screen, you can see there's sort of a line directly in front of them. And then you can see actually their tracks back. So this was a picture I took a few years ago of, of a really interesting afternoon where a male bear had started following this female bear uh, and, and he was following her through smell. And you can't see it in this photo, unfortunately, because he was quite far away by the time we got to this, but um, she, circled back so she created this big loop then doubled back on her own tracks so, to like throw off the male bear and to get away from him um so really uh it was a it was a tense time to say the least on the tundra we were all rooting for her but um yeah it's something that pretty much they have to keep a watchful eye out for those you know two two three years that they are a mom all right, so let's say that they, they, they make the voyage and they get back to a decent hunting area. And so those early hunts are so critical, right? You've got mom who's been fasting for, for months now. And to be honest, they're also kind of complicated. Uh, I'm sure, you know, anyone who's been a mom or maybe single moms out there trying to juggle going to work and, and having daycare for your kids can be certainly a tricky one. And so... The cubs are pretty good. They listen fairly well. Uh, so there's different forms of hunting. And especially when they have cubs, they kind of have to rely on some of the more passive forms because they're not able to move as quickly, for example, with their cubs. So one example of hunting is called um, still hunting. And then there's also, uh, and then sort of more active hunting is stalking. So still hunting is when they are, are waiting, there'll be a, seal breathing hole, right? Seals are mammals. They still got to come up to the air to uh, come up to the surface to breathe. And so what seals do is they keep a few different holes open on the ice. They'll usually have sort of little clusters of two or three and they actively sort of scratch them to make sure they don't freeze over. And they have to come up to them periodically to breathe. And so what a polar bear will do is they'll lay down beside there and they'll wait very patiently. Sometimes they can wait there for hours um, for a seal to come up and use that hole and take a breath. And when they do, they nab them like a really quick hook but with their with their mouth and their paws, and then they pull them out of the water. Because a seal once out of the water is ultimately defenseless. And so a bear that's normally, you know, still hunting, used to waiting for hours, well, if you can imagine having a little cub along, their patience is not quite what it might be. And so mom might do a huff and a growl, and, and that'll be enough to get little cub to be silent. But as you can imagine, especially if you've got one or two, you know, imagine your kids in the back seat and you tell them to be quiet. If you got one starts to poke the other one at the ribs, it doesn't take very long before they start moving around. And on the sea ice, sound travels really, really well. And so if they can, if a seal can hear something moving on the surface, it's not going to choose that breathing hole. So as you can tell, it's a lot harder to get a solid hunt in early on. But eventually they do make um, some successful hunts. And that will also be the cub's first meal. So they're able to start eating meat and that blubber alongside mom right around that age, uh, pretty much as, make, as soon as she makes her first hunt. So that's great in two ways, because now they're not just relying on mom directly to convert that energy um, and to drink it through milk, but now they have direct access to that energy as well. So very, very critical time. So that's breathing hole when they're doing that type of hunting. The other hunting in the springtime that is so critical is they're hunting the seal pups and looking for them in their snow dens or ice layers as well. So one is just a, oh, what am I trying to say here? There's a model of, of what that might look like on the inside. And then the, the big picture in the background is actually kind of what it would look like on the inside of, of one of those layers for the ring seals, kind of similar to our polar bear den, but 
but you want that to hole right back into the ice. Kind of like a, it's the ice version of a beaver dam, is how I always think about it. But anyways, what polar bears will do here is again, they'll try to creep up to them very, very silently. And then if they can hear a seal underneath the snow and the seal hasn't become aware of them yet, what the polar bear does is it stands up on its back legs and puts all its weight forward and smashes down through the top of that. And in the confusion of the snow caving in, tries to grab the seal before the seal or the seal pup can jump back into the ice into the, or through the ice into the water. And so, especially the seal pups who are also brand new to the world are kind of unaware of these things. And so they're a bit of an easier meal for the polar bear, certainly than the adult. And so the little seal pup, which is doing the same thing that the polar bear cub is doing is converting its mother's milk into its own fat on its body. Um, can be a really great meal to keep our our polar bear and mama and her cub alive and going. So this is kind of cool. This is the blubber, right? So that's the, the fat that those marine mammals have. This is an example from a bowhead whale, but the calories would probably be about the same or in the same ballpark talking about our ring seals here. So in 100 grams, there's more, there's almost 900 calories. So if you think about that, if they eat a kilogram of fat, so if they eat a couple pounds of fat, they're getting pretty well about 10,000 calories, which is an insane amount. That is so many, right? And really, uh, they've actually looked into this a little bit, and the average polar bear does need around 10,000 or 12,000 calories to get through just a normal day. Forget about hunting or doing anything extra, just, just a normal day, that's how many it needs to consume. And so, that's, um, that goes back to that fast and feast cycle that I was talking about with polar bears. So if they catch and kill an adult and they eat all of the, the blubber off of that, then that's enough to, right, to carry them through for about a week, maybe even eight, nine days, right? Because then their body will use all of that. So they don't need to be successful hunters every day. They really need to be a successful hunter about once a week if they're hunting adults. If they're hunting pups, then they do need to be probably successful almost on a daily rate. But again, pups are easier to hunt. So it's... Uh, the bit of a balance to be struck there. And I guess one thing I sort of want to point out out of this that we've been talking about, and maybe some people, I can't see any of your faces, unfortunately, um, but maybe some people have already been cringing at this as I've been joyously talking about how easily and how well the uh, polar bears are able to hunt baby seals, right? Uh, but the reality here is that you know, our sensitive human nature, we don't like to think about it, but ultimately, in order for one baby to survive, another baby is being eaten. And so it has to die. And I think, you know, we, we as humans, we have this sense of what's right and what's wrong. Um, and I think we try to apply that onto nature, but I don't think, again, I, you know, in my own humanness, I can't claim to know what, how nature's rules work, but but I don't think nature sees things as right or wrong, right? It simply is. Uh, and both of those lives deserve respect and are beautiful and, you know, but it, it, um, it all exists within a cycle. And so it's not sort of to judge or be judged or, I don't know, maybe when you sit back and you, you watch the BBC video or you come to Churchill and you have a chance to see some of this with your own eyes, maybe you do have, you know, some empathy for both sides, but ultimately this is the world that they exist in. Um, and that it's, you know, it will go on sort of long before us and uh, fairly good odds, maybe even long after us. All right, enough philosophy. Let's go back to little babies. Or I guess they're not little babies, they're growing bigger, right? So really, if that first season of hunting is successful and mom gets her first meals and the cub survives and mom puts on some body weight back and starts to, you know, take a little better care of herself and for them, uh, you know, that first year, the cub never leaves mom's sight. Uh, they, you know, they don't ever get that far away from each other. Really, just it's just a few steps behind, really, at the most. Um, and sort of that goes in inverse too, right? If she, if the cub never leaves mom's sight, that means that that cub also sees everything that mom is doing, right? This is this huge time of learning, and they're like sponges for information. And probably the the first thing that they learn. And one of the coolest things in my mind that they learn is they actually map where they were born. So 
remember before when I said they have that den fidelity, they will go back sometimes to the same den, but more likely not the same den, just generally the same place. Um, but they can do that after covering really massive ranges with like they can spend their first year with their mom going all across the sea ice. And then when they come back, uh, the cub will know how to come back to that original place. So just to give a frame of reference for that, a small home range for a polar bear is around 50 to 60 square kilometers or around, you know, 20 some square, uh, 23 some, uh, 23,000 uh, square miles. So in rough approximations, a small habitat or a small home range for a polar bear is roughly the size of Costa Rica or for Ireland. So imagine being one year old, traveling all across Ireland, and then making your way back to where you started from. That's the, that's the type of level of thing they're learning. A big range for uh, a big average range for polar bear is roughly the size of Norway or the Congo, right? So these bears are traveling huge distances, but their instincts are already informing them of how to find their way back to the place that they were born. Now the males, they're not going to go back to the places that they den, but the females will be using that information for when they become mothers a few years down the road, which is pretty darn amazing. Now, so they're learning sort of that net, like that navigation aspect gets picked up, but they're also going to be learning hunting too. So we talked about sort of some, some basics of hunting, but they're also going to learn like preferences and styles from their mom too. Right, they're going to learn to do. If she's good at some things and bad at others, she's. They're going to learn those those different tactics or those preferences. Um, you know, we talk about like society and culture, and it all starts with your family culture. And the same is even true for polar bears. So you know, you think about it. Is it rude to take off your shoes or not take off your shoes when you go into someone's home? Or do you call people sir and ma'am? Or you know, um, maybe you get a bit of road rage because your dad got, used to get road rage driving right when you were in the city. Uh, the funny one, which I will admit to, that I only learned was a bit of an odd thing, I guess this summer, is that uh, when I was growing up, as a funny family preference, uh, so when we had omelets as kids, or omelets at home, we would have them with mayonnaise and cheese, which I realize now sounds strange to people, um, but that's what we had growing up, so I just thought it was normal. And then I grew up and told this to other people, and they're like, what? That was really bizarre. And so I eventually asked my mom, um, and she said that it was our dad who did it. And so unfortunately, I'm never going to find out where he got that source from. But uh, yeah, you don't even know where your preferences come from until you really start looking into it. What do you know from? So the omelet strange equivalent maybe in the polar bear world is that some polar bears right, pick up different skills. Their curiosity and desire to learn and their intrigue by different things means that they get different specializations. So this was really big in the news in the last couple of years or this was more than, I guess it was two years ago now, um, was that there was sort of evidence of different polar bears hunting reindeer, which hadn't really been uh, recorded or, or not sort of scientifically recorded, right? And so there was this whole thing that if your mom teaches you the skills to hunt a reindeer, then potentially there are some subsets where they would actually get good at this. Now, I'm not saying this would ever sort of replace them back from being the marine mammals that they are, but it's an extra tool in their toolkit, right? Another one, speaking of tools, which is really amazing, is that there, uh, there's all these old Inuit stories of polar bears either using rocks or blocks of ice to smash walruses, because walruses are really big and really hard to take down. Normally, you know, only like the biggest, strongest male polar bears would have a chance of taking down a walrus because they weigh like 2,000 pounds. But there are these stories that have been passed down of talking about bears using tools to take down walruses. And I'm not proud to say this, but the scientific community was like, no, that's not true. That's just a folklore, da da da. Right? Unfortunately, they were very narrow minded um, in this because Inuit have been saying it for a long time that bears use tools. Um, and then just recently, again, I think in the last year, there was someone who actually finally did see a record of a bear throwing rocks down onto a harem of walruses in order to. Um, injure them and be able to, to get one, which is pretty amazing, right? Like there's a lot of forethought to build a trap like that and to like understand your environment and the complexity of, of what's going on around you, which is pretty amazing. Uh, there's a, a quote from a, a hunter north of Churchill in Ranklin Inlet. And he was saying that 
the best of all hunters are the females because they're the ones, right? They don't have the large body size, so they lose sort of that sheer force attack and they have the most at stake to raise their young. And so they tend to come with the most innovative ways um, in order to hunt. So pretty, pretty darn amazing, I would say. And they're not just learning um, how to hunt from their mums, but they're also learning how to play fight, right? That starts off from a very young and adorable age, which are skills, right, that are going to be needed to build up for later on, either to defend themselves um, or to fight for their own mates in the future. Another funny preference that can be tracked is um, even sexual preferences. So there is, uh, folks have heard of it, right? Every now and again, it does happen. It's really rare that polar bears and grizzlies will rehybridize, and those young are um, can be are fertile. And so what happens out of that, there was a really interesting one. I think she was in Alaska. So she was a, I gotta get this right. So they had the hybrid, so that we'll call it the Pisley, right? The polar bear grizzly. So that hybrid, she had daughters and all of her daughters kept mating with grizzlies, right? So that, that tendency seemed to have been passed down um, into her offspring, which is, which is pretty cute and pretty funny. All right, how do you, I will wrap us up here in just one second. So, by the end of the, um, by the second year, they're roughly the same size as mom. That she's still nursing, but that's essentially mostly as a family tie. Uh, you know, sort of the cubs at this point should be able to somewhat successfully hunt for themselves, maybe not consistently, but they're getting to that point. Um, the nursing, you know, the fat content of that's only about 5%. It's more so about the family bond. And that breaks away. And then it sort of comes to the end of mom's job, right? It's time for the cubs to be weaned and they'll be, needing to head off, learning to hunt for themselves. She might just walk away from them one day, to be honest. She might chase them off. A male might chase them off who wants to breed with her now that, uh, now that she's an estrus. And so she'll spend three years getting them ready for the big wide world, and then it's time for them to make it on their own. Now, I'm gonna squeeze this in. I think I've got enough time to do this. Uh, lots of people ask me when they find out, or if they find out that I'm a polar bear guide, what my favorite polar bear fact is. And that's what I wanted to leave you with today. So my favorite fact about polar bears is that uh, in the world today, you can, you know, we, we actually, what's the right word? We uh, decoded the, the DNA or we did the full genetic, um, the genome of polar bears in 2012. And after doing all that DNA analysis, one of the things that we've learned is that there's different sort of genetic, um, lines or lineages that you can find in polar bears and there's sort of a pacific one and there's a north atlantic one and what we learned is that in the last ice age so sometime between the last 12,000 and 90,000 years um, all the polar bears that exist today all exist because of one matriarch one line that survived uh, that made it through the changing sort of the, ex the expansion and the contraction of, of that glacial ice period uh, and so to me i think that is the coolest fact that all of the polar bears today can be traced back to uh, one bloodline, to one mother who, you know, really powered through and, and did an amazing job. So with that, I will end it there and take a couple of questions. All right, thank you, Christina. Let's get to some of these questions right away. So what is the greatest risk to a polar bear survival? What, what, what causes the die off? Yeah, it depends on the age. So the the first couple years um, is sort of cub survival. So that's getting enough, like the, honestly, like getting wet. Honestly, will kill off a lot of cubs when they start off. Um, getting enough nutrition, right? If mom isn't healthy enough, then she's not getting enough nutrition back to the cubs. And sibling competition, right? Often you'll have two, but one sibling will become stronger, and the other one will actually end up becoming too weak. So that's kind of the first couple years years three and four are the first years they learn to hunt for themselves and if they're not successful that's the next really biggest die off and then pretty much if they become successful hunters and make it their adult life they're usually pretty good as long as they um let's say hunting is relatively good uh but injury is the next bad one if an adult polar bear gets injured especially like a jaw broken leg odds are they probably won't make it great thank you for that so how come the the mom and the cubs don't actually stay longer than two months in the den yeah uh, it's all because of mom's body condition right the longer she spends in the den the more time uh she is away from 
the food source. So they time the they it's this balance between are the cubs old enough and strong enough to start moving and how much energy does mom have left in her body? Uh, because remember when I said that phytoplankton boom? That's the that's the domino effect of all of the food availability in the Arctic. So a good a good mom wants to have her cubs there and ready for that sort of food chain to start off. So how many seal pups are born to each female seal if they're eating in, that many? In general, just one. Um, but if you're, so the populations are very different. So I said there's around 25,000 polar bears in the Arctic, but there's about 2 million ring seals in the Arctic. So that's where the difference gets made up. If a polar bear and a grizzly bear happen to meet up, would they fight or avoid each other? I think that would have a lot to do with the time of year, food scarcity, uh, male, female. There's a whole bunch of things that could fit into that. As a general rule of thumb, they probably wouldn't have much to want much to do with each other unless there was a reason to compete. And then also if it's uh, you know a female who's ovulating, that's another different story on either species. Uh, so if the polar bear has twins on average, are they all by the same father? No, so uh, they can be, but you can also have one male get chased off by a larger male. Um, in general, it's very rare to have identical twins. You more often have what's called paternal twins, when you have either like different sperm that have fertilized each or even different fathers from di uh, different sperm from different fathers. Great. Well, thank you for answering those questions. Unfortunately, that's going to be the last one that we do have time for today. So I'd like to throw it back to you for your closing comments. Thank you everyone for joining in today. Um, a big shout out to all the moms out there, Arctic or non. Thank you for all the energy and all the love you, you put into your children. And yeah, I will say for myself, very excited. I'll be back up in Churchill in like two, three weeks. So hopefully have a chance to lay some eyes on this year's new baby cubs, fingers crossed. Uh, but in the meantime, take care everyone. Christina, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.